So with this whole surgery, it um, really got me to thinking a little bit that, um, you know, it's really important. Focus is really, really important. Um, after the surgery, things were just pretty blurry and just, just really having a hard time to see. And, and it really made me appreciate the fact when I could, finally after those four or five days that things started to kind of come together and my focus was returning to me, it made me appreciate my ability to focus a little bit more. It also reminded me of the importance to focus a little bit more too. Uh, we are in the sermon series that I've entitled called Kingdom Focus. And um, I, I named it that because like everything else in life, there are things that happen to us that kind of causes us to lose our focus uh, from time to time. Uh, there are things that distract us, that, that blur our vision and our purpose. And, and so this sermon series was, was designed with that in mind, that uh, a call back to just be focused on the God's kingdom. And, and what I want to do with you here now is just review with you a little bit. It's been two weeks since I've been with you to preach, and, and uh, just want to just wanna remind you where we've been so far in the series. If you were with us the first week, we talked about making God's kingdom first in your life. That it has to be a priority. Jesus has said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he said, seek first his kingdom. That's God's kingdom and God's righteousness. Seek first those things. And all the other things that you worry about, that you stress over, that you freak out about, God's going to take care of those things. He's going to provide for you. I reminded you in that sermon that there are two kingdoms, and everybody belongs to one or two, uh, one, of, one of two of these two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of light, and then there's the kingdom of darkness. And for those who have made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, man, something miraculous happened. God transferred you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And if um, Jesus says, make my kingdom first place in your life. Seek citizenship with me first. And when you do that, when you seek God's kingdom first, some blessings come as a result of that. And that led us to week two when we talked about the blessings of kingdom people. And, and it's interesting, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 11, which is the section of scripture right before our text today, uh, we learned that if you're seeking God's kingdom first, if you're seeking his righteousness first, uh, there's some blessings that are attached to that. Eight blessings, as a matter of fact. We know them as the Beatitudes. Uh, but these are the blessings that are tied to being a person who seeks God's kingdom first, who makes it a priority above anything else in your life. Uh, today we're talking about the impact of kingdom people. Because more than just simply sitting back and enjoying some of the blessings that God promises to give to those who are a part of his kingdom, more than just sitting back and enjoying those blessings, uh, there's this huge responsibility and privilege that God expects kingdom people to live out. We are called to influence and to impact the world around us. Our text comes right on the heels of the blessings that Jesus got done, just got, got done telling everybody about. And uh, our text is going to be in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Uh, but before we read it, I, I want to remind you about what's taking place, okay? Jesus has just officially started his earthly ministry. He's about 30 years old now, and uh, he comes out of the gates, and man, he hits the ground running. And he's preaching this sermon to a large crowd that has begun to kind of be curious about him. Some of them are there to seek him and to follow after him. Others are just curious because they've heard about Jesus and they want to see what this guy's all about. And so what you need to understand is that Jesus is speaking to, a, uh, to two groups of people. Uh, there are those who have made the decision to follow him. And, and then there are those who are merely curious, who are kind of like on the, the margins of wanting to know what that's all about. But the second thing that you need to know as Jesus is preaching this Sermon on the Mount, is this. There is this great paradox that Jesus addresses. You see, on the one hand, a disciple of Jesus is no different than anyone else. But the other side of that, the, on the other hand, a disciple is supposed to be completely different from everybody else. And he addresses this, this, this paradox. And then let me just kind of explain this great paradox if I can. Uh, on the one hand, a disciple of Jesus is no different than anybody else in the sense that we're not better than anyone else. We aren't disciples of Jesus because somehow, you know, God looked at you and he was so impressed with you that he's like, 
I want that person to be a part of my kingdom. That's not why we are followers of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with the fact that we are so worthy or so great or so much better than the rest of the world. And so in that sense, that isn't what Jesus is talking about when he's like, hey, you, you guys, you're not any better than anybody else. We were all sinners. And, and, and so when we share the gospel with others who aren't saved, it's important that we remember that we're not any better than anybody else. We know what it means when Jesus himself said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember when he said that back in the Beatitudes we learned last time I was with you? What that means is that blessed are those who are dependent upon God, who are spiritually bankrupt. And we've all been there. Uh, And so when we share Jesus Christ with the rest of the world, we, we do it from a place of shared brokenness, shared unworthiness. We are simply a beggar who has found bread. And it's our responsibility to share that bread with other beggars. But on the other hand, a disciple of Jesus is completely different than anyone else. And the reason that a disciple of Jesus is completely different than anyone else is because God himself is completely different than anyone else. And so when you chose to follow Jesus Christ, as I said earlier, this amazing transformation takes place. Corinthians talks about it. This old is gone, and this new has come. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so now we are set apart. We're different. Uh, We've been set apart for a purpose. We have a mission. We have a great responsibility as well as a great mission, and today we're going to talk about that. In our text, Jesus tells us two ways in which kingdom people are to be making a difference or an impact in the world in which they live. I want to read our text this morning, and then I want to kind of go back and dissect it a little bit. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, Jesus says these very familiar words, but very powerful and profound words at the same time. He says, uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So here's the first analogy that Jesus makes It's in the last half of verse 13. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Or sorry, you are the salt of the earth. Uh, Two interesting details about this phrase I want to point out and bring to your attention first. First, in the original Greek language uh, that this was written, the you is emphatic in the text. In other words, you and you alone are the salt of the earth. If things are going to change, if things are going to get better in this world, It's dependent upon you and upon me to impact the world. People who belong to the kingdom of light. Second interesting detail about this phrase is that this is a phrase or statement of fact. Jesus doesn't say, uh, you should be the salt of the earth. It's a phrase that is a declaration. You are the salt of the earth if you're my follower. What a strange analogy, isn't it? Why salt? Why not paprika or chili powder or pepper? It may seem strange until you understand the culture that Jesus is living in. You see, the job of salt was primarily to be a preservative. If you've been in uh, church for any length of time, you've probably heard a sermon on this. You understand that. You see, they didn't have refrigerators. And so in order to keep meat from decaying and rotting away, they would salt it. They would cure it. So this analogy, if we follow it out further, Jesus is saying that the earth is decaying. It's like rotting meat. But you are the salt of the earth. You are the preservative of the earth. Kind of reminds me of an Old Testament story. In Genesis chapter 18, we find Abraham and God, and they're having a very interesting conversation. God has just told Abraham that he is going to give birth and have a son, that he, that he and his wife are going to give birth and have a son. And uh, they were astonished. They were amazed. And then shortly following that, God tells him that, well, I'm also going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And if you remember that, Abraham was really concerned about Sodom because he has his nephew Lot living there. And so Abraham begins to bargain with God, and he's like, whoa, 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 you, you, you can't destroy the city of Sodom, Lord. Well, what if there were 50 people living in the city of Sodom? Would you destroy the world for, you know, would you destroy, destroy the entire city, including the 50 righteous people who were living there? And uh, in, in verse 24, uh, in, if you read through Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 and 24, you hear him just kind of pleading and making this case to God for it. And in verses 26, the Lord responds. And he says to Abraham, he says, okay, okay, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous people living within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. Now, how many people here this morning think God is true to his word, that he would keep good on his promise if he says he's going to do something he would do it right i believe wholeheartedly if there would have been 50 people righteous people living in sodom god would not have destroyed the city so as you read on further there in, in genesis chapter 18 abraham gives it some thought and he's like i'm sure he's doing one of these numbers like trying to count up 50 50 righteous people in his mind who were living in sodom and he, and he couldn't come up with 50 so he goes back to God and he's like, uh, yeah, about that 50. What about if there's 45, God? And, and this bargaining goes back and forth. He's like, yeah, sure, I, I won't destroy the city if there's 45. But well, what about 40? What about 30? What about 20? Lord, what if there are 10 righteous people living in Sodom? Would you please spare the city of Sodom if there were 10 righteous people living there? God says, yeah. Here's the thing, though. God knew there weren't 10 righteous people living in Sodom. But if there had been, if there had been ten righteous people living in the city of Sodom, God would have spared it. If there had been salt living in that city, it would have preserved the city. The ironic thing is that um, the city of Sodom was going to be destroyed, but Lot and his wife and his family were all rescued. And, and as they were leaving and fleeing from the city, uh, you remember what happened to Lot's wife? Uh, she looked back to see what was happening to the city that she loved and and she became the salt of the earth. Uh, she literally became a pillar of salt. You are salt. How are you doing at being salt? And maybe you're here this morning, and quite honestly, if we're being transparent and open with one another, you're like, I'm not doing too good at that. That's a hard thing, Mark. Well, I want to talk to you now about three reasons when, or three occurrences when salt is not effective. Because if you're not having any success living out as salt in this world, that could be that it's one of these three reasons. Here's the first reason that salt is ineffective, uh, when salt is left in the, sac in the shaker. When salt is gathered together with other salt and it's in a shaker, now that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's where you want to store salt. That's where it belongs in its proper place. But it's not doing its job, it's not doing its purpose if it's simply left in the shaker and not being poured out. I'm thankful that you are here today. I'm thankful that you decided to, jo to show up and, and come to the shaker today. But hear me on this, when Christians only surround themselves with other Christians, when Christians only spend time with other Christians, you're no longer the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the shaker. In my lifetime, it seems that there's this dangerous trend that is taking place, and I've been guilty of it myself. So please understand, I'm pointing the finger at me as well. But it seems as though Christians nowadays are insulating themselves more and more and more from the world. And I understand that's a paradox in and of itself, that, that well, I thought we are supposed to be different than the rest of the world. Yes, we are, but we're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. We're, not, we're supposed to be living in the world. Don't be worldly, but be in the world because you're salt. You're the salt of the earth. And it seems as though Christians are removing themselves more and more and retreating more and more and surrounding themselves more and more and hanging out with more and more salt, which isn't bad. But if that's the only thing you're doing, I'm often guilty of only associating with Christian people, and frankly, that's not what I've been called to do. And neither have you. It's interesting, one of the descriptions of Jesus was that he was called a friend of sinners and a friend of tax collectors. And I wonder to myself, could the same thing be said about me? Would sinners consider themselves a friend of mine? 
could I be considered their friend? Now listen, that doesn't mean that you have to compromise your standards. It doesn't mean that you stoop to their level and begin to live life like they begin to live life. But you can be loving and grace-giving to non-Christians and not looking down your nose on them. Remember, we're no better than they are. We are, just, we are a beggar just like them, only we have found the bread of life. And we need to share that bread with them. Here's the second occurrence when salt is not very effective. And here uh, it is when there isn't enough salt poured out. I like salt. I I might be classified as a saltaholic. In fact, give me a bag of chips any day of the week over a candy bar. I prefer savory to sweet. And one of my complaints about salt shakers is they don't make the holes on top of a salt shaker big enough. You can sit there and you, you're sitting here doing this for what seems like 30 minutes trying to get enough salt to come out so it seasons and flavors your food. I mean, some of you might look at this picture and you might be like, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's a toothbrush holder. In my opinion, that would be an excellent salt shaker. Get the salt out where it needs to be. And one of the reasons that salt isn't as effective as it could be or should be is because there's not enough of it. Jesus addresses the problem in Matthew chapter 9, in verses 36 through 38. Seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. There's not enough salt to go around. What's he say to do about it? Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Pray for more salt. Here's the third and final occurrence of when salt isn't very effective, when salt gets diluted. It loses its saltiness when it gets diluted. Going back to our text, Jesus says, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. When, when, When salt becomes too much like the world, when there is no longer a distinct difference Christians have gotten so mixed up in the world that you can't tell the difference from those who profess to follow Jesus Christ and those who are in the world. There's nothing special about us anymore. In fact, we're good for nothing, Scripture says. We're good, uh, the only thing we're good for is to be trampled underfoot. Jesus says and reminds us, you are the salt of the earth. Make a difference in this world in which you live. Here's the second analogy that uh, Jesus gives on how kingdom people are to be impacting the world around them. He says, you are the light of the world. Again, the statement places the emphasis on you, and it's a statement of fact. It's a declaration. Jesus says in verses 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all of those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In those verses we just read, Jesus makes it very clear that light is most effective when it is elevated and when it's illuminated. In other words, when light is in a position to be seen and when the light is turned on, that is when light is most effective. It doesn't do any good. When the light's turned off. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Hey, what is the planet's, what is the planet Earth's main source of light? Sun, thank you. It was the sun, right? Remember when you were trying to name all the planets, it was like I got two right. The big yellow one's the sun, and then that blue one is Earth, right? And I was like, yeah, obviously the sun is what gives the Earth its light. Question, how many hours in a 24-hour period does the sun shine? Here's the answer, 24 hours. The sun is always shining. It's just shining on different people. And here's the problem. The problem is that Jesus says you are the light of the world. But the problem is we want to be the light bulb of the world. We want to be able to turn it on and turn it off when it's convenient for me. You know, and and too many Christians are good at flipping the switch when they need to. They come to church, they let their light shine. 
they're singing songs, they brought their Bible, they go to Sunday school, but as soon as church is over, the switch is flipped. Their language, their behavior, their actions, their thoughts, everything changes. What our goal needs to be as the light of the world is for us to have consistent character, consistent integrity. Then in verse 16, Jesus issues the challenge. In verse 16, Jesus says this, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and glorify your Father who's in heaven. In other words, your actions should show that you're a Christian. Do you know how fast light travels? Light travels at a ridiculous speed. 186,000 miles every second. In one second, light could travel around the world seven and a half times. It's moving. I think there's a reason that Jesus says to let your light shine. Because the world is watching. They're watching how you and I are reacting and acting. Your actions are speaking so loudly, however, sometimes that your words have no effect on them. Your actions will get to lost people much faster than your words ever will because light travels faster than sound. And so it's really important to let your light shine in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Hey, what's the difference between a good work and a good thing? Ephesians chapter 2 talks about good works. He says, um, Paul writes and he says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here's what a good work is. A good work is a beneficial action that helps someone else for which God gets the credit. A beneficial action that helps someone else for which God gets the credit. You see, the difference between a good work and a good thing is that non-Christians can do good things all the time. Non-Christians feed the poor. Non-Christians build hospitals and orphanages. Non-Christians give money to charity. But to do a good work is to do what you've been created by God Almighty and set apart to do. And when you do it, you're not taking credit for yourself. You're not kind of inside giving yourself the, the pat on the back and feeling good. What you're doing is you're giving God the glory and saying, I'm doing this because I love God. And he loves you. It's vitally important that as you let your light shine, that God gets a good name. And more than just doing something nice for someone for the sake of, of being a good human being, we do good works for the sake of bringing glory to God's name. Well, I'm going to get ready to land the plane, but we're going to circle a little bit here, so please stick with me. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, Jesus said these words. He says, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who's in heaven. Jesus says this, that if you're unwilling to identify him before your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, if you praise him at church, but then you don't know him at work, you praise him at, at church, but, but you don't know him when you're with your friends, if he's not a part of your equation every single day, if you pray to God and you're, you're wanting him to, to step in and do something, and you're wanting Christ's approval of that prayer, and you're praying in his name, when he's an embarrassment to you in front of your non-Christian friends, Jesus says, you deny me before your friends, I'm going to deny you before my heavenly Father. When we leave this place, we're called and commanded to make an impact on the world. And you can't do that if you leave your faith sitting in the place where you're currently sitting. If you were accused at work or at school of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If your neighbors were, were told that so-and-so is a Christian, would, would they believe it? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You're to be making a difference and impact for the kingdom of God. Our gathering here is kind of like the huddle, like a huddle in a football game. 80,000 people aren't paying $100 a ticket to watch 11 men stand in a circle and then clap their hands. Uh, that's not why they came. 
they don't mind them standing in that circle for about 25 seconds. But they want to see what difference the huddle will make. They want to know if having huddled, can you now score? Can you get a first down? They want to know what you're going to do about the 11 other men on the other side of the football daring you to go public with your private conversation. They want to see what impact you're going to have. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. What difference are you going to make when you leave this huddle? What impact are you going to make? Have you heard the news? It's been reported that Carthage is getting a bowling alley. I like bowling, but there's one problem. I'm horrible at it. I'm terrible. And bowling is is a lot like golf in the sense that there's a lot of right clothes that you can wear. You can look pretty spiffy as you get the right kind of equipment there, you know. You can get the, the shoes, the pants, the shirt, the brace, the ball. You can look really fancy, okay. When I go bowling, I don't, I don't own any of that stuff. I, in fact, I'm paying somebody $2 to let me wear their shoes, you know. And they spray the stuff. Anyway, um, you, can, you can look the part. You can look the part. You can look good. And as you stand there holding the ball and you're assessing the pins and doing the look and you make your approach and one, two, and when you finally release the ball and you twist the wrist and you kick the leg, you know, the whole thing, you can look really good. But here's the thing. If that ball's in the gutter, you failed. And the reason that you failed is because there was no impact. A lot of Christians are looking good, but we're not going anywhere. The measure of my life, the measure of your life, the measure of our life is not how nice or good of a person we are or how well behaved we are. The measure of our life is based upon what impact are we making in our world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. As individuals, as families, as a church. I'm going to ask our praise band to come forward this morning and we're going to get ready to sing our song of, of decision here. And I'm going to ask our elders to come forward, and and they're going to be ready here in front to receive your decision. The challenge that I want to leave you with here this morning is, will you make the deliberate effort, the deliberate choice to be salt and to be light to the world in which you live? Wherever God has planted you, will you choose to grow? Will you choose to shine? We want to pray with you. We want to partner with you and encourage you as we impact our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplace for Christ. Let's stand together this morning. I'm going to close this in prayer, and then we're going to have our time of decision, okay? Let's pray. Father God, this morning, uh, we are so grateful that you have included us in part of your plans. God, you could have done this all on your own and done it a whole lot better. But yet, God, you choose in, in your grace and in your mercy to include us in that thank you god forgive us at times when we've not taken that responsibility as seriously as we should forgive us at times for making excuses as to why we can't god help us this morning to understand that paradox of being in the world but not being of the world help us to understand that conflict and what it looks like God, I'm so thankful for uh, Burnside Christian Church and and the influence and the impact it has had in this community. And I pray for more of that to take place. God, the church is the people. And this week, as we leave here this morning, I I pray that uh, we would um, be the hands and feet of Jesus that people need in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.